who played Q in the James Bond films. I was particularly upset as only a short while before I'd worked with Desmond making the film you're about to see and a second documentary to be shown on HTV next week. These programmes have now become a tribute to this likeable man who I had the privilege to meet and interview. For me, Desmond Llewellyn will always be a very special Welshman. To uh, background action. Uh, Piers on cue first. Right. Okay, and uh, action! Well, that went very well, yes. and we're on schedule. Now, look, the next one is this uh, interview for HTV. And because it's HTV, obviously, they'll want to talk to you about your background in Wales, growing up in Wales, so, um, which I know you like to talk about anyway. Nicola Hayward-Thomas is going to be doing the interview, and she's a big fan of yours. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh. Yeah. Oh, time for oh. Later, perhaps. All over the world, Desmond Llewellyn is recognised as the gadget-loving Q from the James Bond films. He's appeared in 17 Bond adventures, and the toffee-nosed public school-educated Q has become a piece of British cinema tradition. But not many people know that Desmond's not English at all. Actually, he's Welsh. And that's why I wanted to find out more about him. We also followed Desmond onto the set of The World Is Not Enough. Desmond is in his 80s, 20 years older than the age when most people retire. Some of the Bond team remember him from the beginning. Although I wasn't working on uh, the films, I was, uh, you know, it's been a family business, and I was a student at the time, and I used to come home on holidays and visit the sets. So I probably met him in From Russia With Love. We're issuing this to all 00 personnel. But the queue we see here might have been very different if director Terence Young had had his way. He sort of thought it would be a good idea to have me as a Welshman because uh, when I went to rehearse, he said, how are you going to play this? And I said, well, he's an ordinary civil servant. He said, no, I want you to play him as a Welshman. Well, I said, well, it wouldn't work. I said, all right, Terence, is this what you want? This lovely case, I've got a yellow, just press a button and out come the knife. And he said, no, no, you're quite right. <laughs> so I played him as a toffee-nosed Englishman ever since. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Stella Wilson, How Desmond's are you, publicist. Stella? But I wanted to know if he still felt strongly about his roots. Desmond, do you still think of yourself as Welsh? Well, I'm not completely Welsh, but I mean, I feel Welsh. My Llewellyn side, I mean, they come from Aberdare. And I've always felt myself Welsh. Wales is close to Desmond's heart and he often uses rugby internationals as an excuse for a visit. Desmond was born in 1914. His family were well off. He grew up with nurseries, nannies and servants at Blyna Pant, just north of Newport. The house is still there, but it's now an old people's home and the big garden Desmond played in as a child has long since been built over. My first memories of Blanipand was when I was in a pram in the billiard room. Yeah. Well, this was the hall in here, you see. That in there was the drawing room. Gosh, you the same fireplace. I recognize that. I had a most wonderful childhood. And there was a billiard table. Obviously, looking back, it was very rich and privileged. There was cook and there was a parlour maid, and I think there was one other maid, sort of a between maid. And then in the garden we had a man called Priest, who was the gardener. And then, of course, we had Alan, the groove, to look after the horses. There was Nanny, of course. I must have been a repulsive child. And, in fact, there is a, a story, I was told, that I created such a fuss on her day out that a notice was sort of flashed into the cinema saying, would Nanny Jones please return to Blanapant? Oh, yes, is the banister. It's just slide down, then. Yes. This was the first bedroom I slept in by myself when I went to school. I remember the bed was there, and I had a table down there where I used to paste all the rug cuttings in. Uh. Oh, and there was the window overlooking Tumbalum and Hanacapel Farm, which is gone. 
Oh, it's marvellous. Well, thank you so much. You're it's more than wonderful welcome. to yes. come and revive old memories. For much of his life, the theatre was Desmond's home. But when did he first decide to become an actor? When I was at school at Radley, I joined the Amateur Dramatic Society there as a scene shifter and building scenery. And actually, we rebuilt the stage in the old gym at Radley. And Dennis Price, who was at school with me and shared a study, said, why don't you come and act? And I got the bug. This bug led to drama school and the uncertain profession of acting. His passion for the stage was eventually to lead to the much-loved character that we now associate with Desmond. One theme runs through all Q's dealings with Bond. He's happy to work with him, but doesn't like the way Bond lives. This all started very early on. What I was told originally was that early on, um, Desmond came the first day. And this, is, this is Bond folklore on the set. And at the rehearsal, I'm sitting at a desk working, and Bond came in. And I got up to greet him, you know, and Guy said, no, no, you don't take any notice of him. And I sort of thought, what? This is Bond, you know. Desmond turned to the director and said, well, how do you want me to play this? And the director explained that everyone loves Bond except for you because Bond destroys all your equipment. And, of course, it came at the clue. And, of course, it worked in beautifully with all the lines. And that kind of became the hallmark of the character and the relationship, that they kind of love each other, but on the other hand, Bond goes out and destroys everything that Desmond makes. He is the only one who, um, you know, oh, for heaven's sake, Bond, be your age, and all that sort of thing. Over the years, of course, he's got extremely fond of Bond, but he still doesn't approve of his way of life. Now, pay attention, please. You see the gear leader here? Now, if you In Goldfinger, off, the tension between the two produced a memorable line from Q. Whatever you do, don't touch it. Now, why not? Because you release this section of the roof and engage and fire the passenger ejector seat. Whoosh. Ejector seat? You're joking. I never joke about my work, 007. Ah, Q. In every film, Q's role has developed. Oh, this one really is, is the epitome of the bumbling professor. That uh, I think if push came to shove, he could do it there. Sent out here at a moment's notice, no proper facility. It's good natured friction, you know. It's, 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 um, oh, 007, you know, don't do that, don't do this. You know, this. But I, I, I never played it for real friction. I played it just for, for good humor. Yes, well, you wouldn't have a smaller piece of thread than that, would you? Curious, somebody seems to have stuck a knife in my wallet. Oh, they missed you. What a pity. Anything else? Well, I won't keep it for more than an hour or so if you give me your undivided attention. I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. That's putting it mildly, 007. Ooh. Oh, grow up, 007. After drama school, one of Desmond's first theatre performances was in Becks Hill on the Sussex coast. Delaware Pavilion. Gosh, what memories that brings back. I first came here to the repertory company in 1937. It was a weekly rep, and it was here that I met my wife. Desmond and Pamela were married in 1938. In 1965, they returned to live in Becks Hill when Pamela inherited her great uncle's house. There's Linkwell. It was built about 1820. Ah, and there is a portrait of Great Uncle Richard, my wife's great uncle, who built this house. And now a portrait that, um, well, I suppose I'd better show you. I don't like showing it. And that actually was painted at Blinder Pant. I don't know how old I was. I think it's terrifying, but uh, my sons love it. So as a young actor, mm -hmm. you were in rep around the country. 
Were those good years? Oh, wonderful. They really were. Um, one didn't realize quite what hard work it was and how horrified the actors of today are. You know, when they sort of realize that in the first year I'd done 40 plays and that one did a new play every week. But they were wonderful days, they really were. The South Wales coast has a special place in Desmond's heart. He spent childhood holidays here at Ogmore by Sea and his mother moved here after his father died. This is Sandy Mount there. I hardly recognize it. It looks so smart. My father bought it in about 1914 or 15. And of course, there were no houses here. And then down here were the most lovely beaches. And I can remember the awful toil up this hill, carrying the picnic baskets. This was the last place in Wales I saw before I went to France in 1940. As we drove away, going up to Denby for entrainment, sort of waving to my mother and my old nanny. And of course, I never saw them again. Well, I saw my old nanny again, but I never saw my mother again. After joining the Royal Welsh Fusiliers as a young lieutenant, Desmond was sent straight to France, where he was soon in battle. At one point, he was ordered to hold up a panzer division. We were up in a barn and a tank came and in front, and we had this thing called the boys' anti-tank rifle. And I said to the sergeant, I said, well, there's the tank, we better fire the anti-tank rifle at it. He said, no, no, don't fire that thing. And I sort of said, well, why not? He said, don't fire it. And I said, nonsense. And I took it and I fired it. Well, the recoil sort of sent me absolutely arse over tip at the back. And there was an enormous flash from the gun, which, of course, the tank saw. And he fired a shell right through. But luckily, the tank was so close, the shell just went right through the building and out the other side. Desmond was forced to surrender and began five long years as a prisoner of war. His acting skills were put to good use in prison camp plays. These photographs were taken by the German officers. After they were cleared by the censors, Desmond sent them home as postcards to his family. After the war, Desmond was offered parts in several films. One of his first post-war roles was as a tank driver in They Were Not Divided. The director was Terence Young, who suggested that Desmond would be ideal as the quartermaster in From Russia With Love. Over 30 years later, Desmond has been called to the set to film his scenes in The World Is Not Enough. Desmond's scenes as Q have become part of James Bond folklore, now no Bond film is complete without Q and his gadgets. Stand by. There's, there's, there's so many elements in a Bond movie that people love. People love the opening stunts, they love the opening credits, but I think the one that's loved above all are the scenes between Q and Bond. This man here is loved. <laughs> you know, the world over. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> On the set of The World Is Not Enough, director Michael Apted rehearses Q's scene. It's his first Bond film, but he's worked with Desmond before. We think it was sort of 70, 71, and so our career together has now spanned nearly 30 years, which is a chilling thought. And he was always just very supportive and terrific to have around. So when he was on this and I was on this, it was heaven. Now Desmond doesn't want to have to handle that much material because he's done enough, I think. So now we've brought in an assistant so we can kind of build a relationship between the two of them. In his role as R, John Cleese will share the task of learning all that high-tech gobbledygook. I don't understand a word and I was absolutely thrilled yesterday because, as you know, I've got John Cleese as my assistant and he had to say all the gibberish that I usually have to say was describing the car, and um, he was going mad. I, I was absolutely thrilled that I hadn't got to say those lines. 
Desmond's difficulty with technical lines became a great source of fun for the third James Bond, Roger Moore. I thought, I know, we'll have some new dialogue here. Uh, and I'd get off with a script girl and uh, uh, sort of dictate even worse gobbledygook than he had already. <laughs> and in my close-ups, he'd be sort of looking at me much and say, you're not going to get this, are you, old boy? And then sometimes he'd put up an idiot board with bollocks written on it. Actually, Desmond is, is only 23 uh, years of age. He looks a little older because of what we did to him. Unlike his screen character, Desmond is completely lost with anything technical. Oh, absolutely hopeless. I wouldn't know a computer if he got up and bit me. I think it works out as something like 30 minutes uh, of you on screen in all the Bond films, and yet yeah. everybody around the world knows Q. Do you get a lot of recognition wherever you go? Oh, it's fascinating. The thing that really pleases me more than anything else is that I'm called Desmond Llewellyn. I mean, all right, I was at Cardiff Arms Park the other day, and I mean, there were quite a lot of people shouting, hi, you're Q, but on the whole, anybody who came up and talked to me, they always called me Llewellyn, you see, which is extremely nice. Desmond is recognised wherever he goes. Even on a visit to one of his childhood haunts in Newport, Desmond can't escape his celebrity status. Desmond is revisiting the Newport Transporter Bridge. When he first saw it, it had only been open for 15 years. This Transporter Bridge, I mean, it is a landmark in Newport. Now he's about to fulfill a childhood ambition, to be the driver and send the platform across the river. To the west. This is probably the biggest gadget Q has ever had his hands on. There you are. It's so simple. You've got no way of telling how it's across the other side of the river. So what is, you've got an old oily rag on the cable. Yeah. And when it's in line with that plank, you know it's across the west side of the bank. Good. All the signs we've got this day and age, it's still an old oily rag. It's so that wonderful. Desmond's life as Q means spending a great deal of time travelling, promoting the Bond films. Even though he's in his 80s, Desmond drives himself as hard as ever. In London's West End, he's reunited with an old friend, the original Aston Martin DB5 from Goldfinger. They're both here to promote the opening of the new James Bond simulator ride, where Desmond is the star guest. Once people know Q is in town, they flock to see him, and the car, of course. This unassuming man is so well known that there's now even a Desmond biography. All round the world, Q is given cult status. Has this brought riches for Desmond? You see, Q is only a small part, so I don't get these millions of pounds. I'm paid extremely well for what I do, but it's only two or three days every two years. I don't sort of drive around in limousines and things like that because I can't afford it. So I go on the bus and I go on the tube and in the train. And uh, as long as I avoid the 4.30 train from Bexhill, which is full of school children who are not reticent, I spend the whole time from Bexhill to Eastbourne or wherever they get off signing autographs. The Bond films are as popular as ever. This is an appeal that crosses generations and goes on from one generation to another. Why? Fantasy. Pure fantasy. Everything is bigger and larger than life. You're sitting there looking at this wonderful life. Ian Fleming was asked what constitutes a good thriller. And he said to any adventure story, add all the advantages of expensive living. Desmond gets a glimpse of expensive living when he's on the road promoting the films. 
the launch of The World is Not Enough in Wales gave him a chance to return to the land of his fathers. God, this is fantastic. Desmond's family went from being miners and publicans to mine owners and managers, and he doesn't know how or why. They covered up their past as they rose up the social ladder. Desmond is left with only fragments of his family history. Well, we're overlooking Aberdare, which is down there, and Cumbach is over there. And this is where, as far as I can make out, my great-grandfather came from. And he was landlord of the Dufferin Arms at Cumbach and was killed in a pit explosion at Letyshenkind. I think he's buried somewhere up here, but I, I've never been able to find anything about him. But how my grandfather became a coal owner, high sheriff of Manmasha, and left a fortune. How did he do it? God, I'd love to know. Desmond wanted to find out whether anything of Seti Schenkin colliery remains today. While visiting the site of the mine, Hello. he found a local family Hello. who knew it well. Letty Shenkin Colliery. That's right. That's where my great grandfather was killed. I've got a, an account of accidents, and I think this was a very dangerous pit. It was. It it was. was. Can you tell me something about this? Yes, I can. Um, Come around, that's right. Now, you see the tops here, the houses? Yes. Well, I was born there, you see. Were but, you really? Yeah, there, was six, there was six Did houses it? there. Yeah. Six houses. The back garden, look. Does anything exist of this colliery at all? Well, the only remaining buildings are the ones you see here. My father's house and the house next door. The colliery has uh, been demolished, you see, and recapped. Yeah. Now, so I you... can show you the location. It was a nostalgic moment for Desmond as he stood at the site of the mine where his great-grandfather died. Only a few stones now mark where the pithead once was. With this Welsh Valley's connection, what about the language? Are you interested in the Welsh language? Oh, I tried to learn it when I was a prisoner of war, but I'm hopeless. And the reason is because I haven't got any rhythm. And yet you are very Welsh. You feel that there's that core of Welshness within yourself. Oh, very. I bet, though, if you go to America or somewhere else in Europe, they refer to you as English actor Desmond Llewellyn. Well, not awful. I mean, I was corrected straight away. And on anything, I will not put British, I put Welsh. You say you can't go on forever. You're giving a pretty good impression of that at the moment, Desmond. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to say so, but... Uh, no, as I always say, you know, I mean, I want to go on as long as the producers want me, and the almighty doesn't. Would there be a point at which you'd say, I really don't think that I should be considered for the next film? Well, I'm very conceited to say no. <laughs> but, I mean, as long as one could reasonably carry on, I, I hope to go on. Desmond Llewellyn, I hope that we will see you as Q for many years more, as many years as Q wishes to carry on. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a delight talking to you. Well, thank you very much. Fascinating. Thank you. In next week's programme, I'll be watching Desmond at work on the 19th Bond film The World Is Not Enough. I'll also be exploring some of Q's favourite gadgets from James Bond movies over the years. And 007 star Pierce Brosnan gives us his personal view of what it's like to work with Desmond. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been the best. It's been the best. It's been sheer magic. To hear of the tragic death in a car accident just before Christmas of one of the world's best-known movie faces. Desmond Llewellyn, who played Q in the James Bond films. I was particularly upset as, just a short while before I'd worked with Desmond, making the film you're about to see. This programme has now become a tribute to Desmond, Q and his gadgets. For me, 
Desmond Llewellyn will always be a very special Welshman. Uh, background action. Uh, Piers on cue first. Right. Okay, and action! On the James Bond set, technicians are making last-minute preparations to film a scene with a very special member of the cast. Is it a jet? In his mid-80s and with a 60-year film career under his belt, Desmond Llewellyn has appeared in almost every James Bond film. In this programme, we go behind the scenes on the James Bond set to watch the world-famous actor at work. We also revisit James Bond films from the early 60s to the present day to find out the secret that makes Q and his gadgets such a cinema success. Right, now pay attention, 007. First, your new car. the people who came to this Newport cinema to see The World Is Not Enough will be aware that Desmond Llewellyn, Q, was born in 1914, only a few miles from here. Most people think he's English because Q has such a public school accent. But Desmond is very definitely Welsh. And because the James Bond films are shown in almost every country, Desmond Llewellyn is one of the most recognised Welshmen in the world. After breakfast at his club, Desmond Llewellyn is driven to Pinewood Studios to film his scenes in The World Is Not Enough. His first film was From Russia With Love in 1963. Since then, he's become a cinema legend. It's incredible when sort of people say, you know, you're making cinema history or whatever it is. Well, of course, Bond is cinema history now, so I suppose anybody who's been connected with Bond is sort of Part of history. Q may now be a movie icon, but his scenes add up to less than 35 minutes screen time. I feel this is also frightfully embarrassing, really. I mean, here I'm arriving with a bloody film crew in the sort of the heart of English film world. Hello, my son, Justin Llewellyn, may be coming in. Can you let him in? OK, so thank you very much. In The World Is Not Enough, Desmond will again be working with 007 star Pierce Brosnan. Pay attention, 007. What does Pierce think about working with Desmond? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been the best. It's been the best. It's been sheer magic. Sheer oh, no, and utter magic, yes. Really? James Bond no. came to life when I met him. Truly, really. I mean, because uh, you know, I was a boy when I saw my first James Bond movie. It was Goldfinger. And I certainly didn't want to be James Bond or any of the baddies or anything like this, but, you know, the part of Q and Desmond's presence in the film captured my imagination. gadgets have ranged from the useful and practical to the eccentric and completely balmy. What's for certain is that you just never know what he'll come up with next. Oh, an obvious little notion. Thought it might come in handy. There's so many elements in a Bond movie that people love. People love the opening stunts, they love the opening credits, but I think the one that's loved above all are the scenes between Q and Bond. And I think just for the sheer lunacy of them all, the gadgets. 
Filming the scenes in Q's workshop can take time, especially when the gadgets call for special effects. Action! Even Bond can sometimes be caught out. <laughs> this scene from Goldeneye was under the control of director Martin Campbell. Several takes were needed before he was satisfied. <laughs> oh, it's well worth a print. Let's do one more. Morning, Q. Sorry about the leg. Skiing. <laughs> Hunting. We actually rigged it so that it, he missed the target and hit the coffee area behind, which I think they lost a little bit in the film, but uh, that, that was quite a fun one to do. Gadget scenes with rockets and explosions can take time to set up. If anything goes wrong during the take, it's back to square one, and even star actors like Desmond may have to hang around for hours for a reshoot. The gadgets fall into three categories. The first is those that really work, like this Bell jetpack from Thunderball. It was developed for the US military in the 60s. The second category is where Q has taken real technology and added an element of fantasy. The linear motor weapon in The Spy Who Loved Me in 1977 was based on real science, but wasn't exactly portable. I want that ready for Ackman's tea party. The third and most popular category of Q's gadgets are the fantasy ones. They're great fun to watch and laugh at, like the Bondola in Moonraker. But some have actually been ahead of their time. These films are set five minutes into the future. If you go back and look at Goldfinger, well, there was a, 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 a radar system in the car. Well, that actually was practical. Reception on the dashboard here. Auto visual range 150 miles. So that kind of becomes the way you figure these things out, that, that anything that is practical today with an unlimited amount of money can go into the film. While Q develops his own gadgets, real-life spies need real gadgets. In a specialist shop in London, would-be secret agents can buy the genuine article. Desmond went to have a look and was intrigued by what was on display. If you remember from um, Diamonds Are Forever, yes. you had a um, voice changer kit. Uh, this is Bert. What's the matter with your voice, Bert? Well, this is yeah. them nowadays. That's the Good size Lord. of them. So this is the latest briefcase. Gosh. We build video cameras into this cellular phone. Yeah. OK, and then there you go. It's you on the monitor there. We can record it. And then so basically I can go into a, a meeting or something like that and someone could be sitting outside watching it, filming it. Good heaven. Slightly different to the one in Russia with love. Technology has moved on. We would have uh, computers and they took up entire rooms with whirling things going around, you know, and today computers in the wristwatch. The march of technology can be seen in Live and Let Die. In 1973, this bug detector was state-of-the-art. In all the earlier films, I seem to remember him searching hotel rooms for bugs and transmitters yeah, right. before yeah. he'd have any sort of conversation in them. Well, this one here has one built in. It detects all transmitters. And what it does is you sweep around the room like that and it'll, it'll vibrate in your hand if it picks up a transmission. So he can also actually just keep it in his pocket if he goes to a meeting that he thinks is being bugged. It'll vibrate in his pocket and he'll know without anyone else knowing. But some of Q's gadgets look so real that even the experts are fooled. In 1965, the British military thought they'd witnessed a breakthrough. If you remember, um, Bond had this, uh, the underwater breathing apparatus. I was sitting in the office one day and the telephone went and... Uh, a fellow said, good morning, this is Major So-and-so from the Royal Engineers. He said, I wonder if you know anything about um, the James Bond film. I said, yes, I do quite, quite well. So he said, tell me, he said, uh, you know, we're very interested in your miniaturised underwater breathing apparatus. He said, uh, could you tell me, you know, um, how long it, uh, you could stay out of water with it? A short periods only, of course, say about four minutes. So I said, yeah, I can tell you exactly, he said, well, Great, I can imagine getting really uh, excited. So he said, well, how long was it? So I said, as long as you can hold your breath. And I can imagine this poor fellow going white. He said, what do you mean? He said, Bond was underwater for three or four minutes. I said, yeah, but that's the skill of the editor. 
all it was with a couple of sparklet um, bottles, you know, used for soda siphon, painted with the, the black and white necks, and we made a little kind of mouthpiece, and that's it, it didn't work. Q's gadgets always seem to give Bond the chance to cheat death and escape the bad guys. As Q explained his gadgets to the new Bond in Goldeneye, it was easy to see that Welshman Desmond and Irishman Pierce were forming a very special Celtic partnership. This man here is loved, you know, the world over. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> yeah, there's a good relationship between Pierce and Desmond, though, probably one of the best relationships between Bond and Q. If you just sign here, Mr. Bond. There was chemistry between the two of them immediately. And then you saw that chemistry build in Tomorrow Never Dies. It's the insurance damage waiver for your beautiful new car. It's watching Desmond as Q do the slow burn is what I liked so much about it and what Desmond did so wonderfully. Will you need collision coverage? Yes. Fire? Probably. Property destruction? Definitely. Personal injury? I hope not, but accidents do happen. They frequently do with you. Pierce has a very Celtic take it's on it all. A great fondness and love, I know that, on, on my behalf, and I've felt it from Desmond as well, but I've always seen kind of the, the role of Q as Merlin. Merlin <laughs> Arthur. Uh, Call me nuts, but there you go. Please try and return some of this equipment. Do please try and return some of this equipment in pristine order. Don't touch that. It's my lunch. Desmond and I are very good. We know our lines. I think there definitely is a, a sort of spark there. I feel rather like a grandfather looking after the grandson in a way, you know. Desmond Llewellyn at Pinewood. This is his first Bond film, and he knows that he must deliver what the audience expects. One of the you know, challenging things of coming to do this film is there are certain elements about it you just have to deliver. You, know, you have to deliver good action, you have to deliver gadgets, you have to deliver beautiful women. You know, that's that, and if you don't deliver that, then you've failed. Good day, good day. But how long can Q keep delivering the goods? Desmond's all too aware of his advancing years. I'm much too old to be Q, but thank God, you know, they've kept me on. And um, even then, I said, look, it's about time I had an assistant. The Bond team had a solution. Now, I want to introduce you to the young fellow I'm grooming to follow me. Desmond doesn't want to have to handle that much material because he's done enough, I think. So now we've brought in an assistant so we can kind of build a relationship between the two of them. So John Cleese, who's playing R, which is Q's assistant, you know, can shoulder some of the load and also, I think, you know, build a kind of amusing relationship between the two of them. Ah. John Cleese brings his familiar brand of comedy to the part of R. Helps if you open the door. And you might be, this is 007. If you're Q, does that make him R? Ah, yes, the legendary 007 wit. Of course, John Cleese is far too diplomatic to reveal whether R will eventually replace Q. I'm playing uh, Q's deputy because uh, Desmond, who's been in 17 of them now, he, apparently he wasn't in the first two or something, and he's done Q ever since. And he started saying to Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson about three movies ago that he ought to have a deputy, someone he's kind of training to take over. So I'm delighted to say they asked me if I'd do it. Titanium armor, a multitasking heads-up display, and six beverage cup holders. All in all, rather stocked. Fully loaded, I think, is the term. I think. You're not here to think. You're here to do what I tell you. After 17 Bond films and hundreds of Q gadgets, Desmond wanted to be reminded of some of his favourites, starting with that famous gyrocopter from You Only Live Twice, Little Nelly. I didn't know what the hell Little Nelly was. I had no idea. And the first time I heard of it was we were lunching at an aerodrome and suddenly this noise appeared. 
And I thought, my God, these chaps are pretty thorough. Fancy mowing the lawn on a Sunday. And somebody said, oh, there's little Nellie arriving. Q always seems to come up with something to fire the imagination. To my astonishment, I found it was this tiny little plane. And of course, it really does work. It was invented by Ken Wallace of the RAF. This can only be for children. Right, now pay attention. Flame guns, two of them, firing astern. Aerial mines, use them only when directly above target. Two machine guns, fixed. Two rocket launchers. These fire heat-seeking air-to-air missiles. That's about a lot, I think. Boats designed by Q have outrun and outgunned the enemy in spectacular bond chases, but they always get destroyed, much to Q's annoyance. In the world is not enough, there's one boat Q doesn't want Bond to wreck. He may have destroyed all the other gadgets that I've made, but um, they're government property. But this time he's actually destroyed one of my boats, the boat that I was building, my fishing boat, for my retirement, and he's wrecked it. So that really does make me mad. Unlike anyone else's retirement boat, this one just happens to be packed with gadgets. It stars in the amazing chase down the Thames in London. For this one action sequence, 14 identical copies of Q's boat were made. We have to have a, a, a lot of boats because we physically can't get all the mechanics in one boat. You know, you've got boats that have rockets and guns coming out of. You've got other boats that are specially designed for jumping and have special reinforcement. You've got other boats which are, you know, fired from big air cannons. I mean, the other point is that we do tend to damage a lot of them when we're doing some of these. And you always have to have, obviously, a backup because once we're out on the river, if something goes wrong or engine goes or something like this, um, you want one that you can immediately go to. When it comes to cars, Q surpassed himself in The World Is Not Enough. This car is certainly well equipped. Every gadget in the car had to be specially designed. Q thinks of everything and uh, even if the car's more or less destroyed, systems will still work. And these pads here are for him to manipulate. Um, and in here we have, um, it's a little screen screen with two converging um, images. And when they converge, then you're going to get the lock-on signal that you get on kind of American jets, and then he fires. That's the one thing they do love in Bond films, and that is car crashes. Where's my Bentley? Oh, he's had its day, I'm afraid. But it's never let me down. M's orders, 007. Yeah. You'll be using this This is the most fascinating car. It's got all the gadgets in it. Revolving number plates, naturally. Valid all countries. Now open the top and inside are your defense mechanism controls. Smoke screen. Oil slick. Rear bulletproof screen. And left and right front wing machine gun. So there we really do have a car that can go underwater. You'd have to wear a breathing apparatus and um, wetsuit, but it does go underwater. The Lotus was specially built in America and actually worked, although it had to be driven by divers. The scene was shot using the underwater car, scale models, and a studio mock-up of its interior. The BMW 750 in Tomorrow Never Dies was crammed with Q's gadgets. I don't know how many cars they actually wrecked, but quite a few. 
Yeah, a couple gone now. But who decides which gadgets will be included? When I wrote the scene, we knew the car would be remotely driven. At use speed, the destrier is involved. Of course, the thing's going to have rockets. And I originally thought the rockets would come out of the headlamps. Instead, Chris Corbett was the one who figured out, no, it'll be the sunroof. So it's things like that. They, it, it, it continually evolves. I always think it's so sad that they didn't have me in the shop. It's the Navy shop, seeing the car come back. Not in pristine order. No one really minds that Q's cars could never really drive with all the gadgets fitted. In the films, they're magnificent and give audiences a real thrill. But what do Welsh filmgoers know and think about Desmond? Desmond Llewellyn, yeah, he's, he's in his 80s, I think. He's been in a lot of films. There's been a lot of hype with this film that he's from Wales, all the big with the Welsh assembly and everything. Saying he's from Wales, but I don't know much more. I didn't know he was a Welshman. Doesn't sound very Welsh. Yes, I would have said before I'd sort of seen him doing interviews that he was English. Very good English accent. Much better than I can do. <laughs> when the bonds have changed and M's changed and everybody else has changed, he sort of stayed That's there the and stayed the same. And I thought it's, I, th I think he's brought a lot to Bond over the years. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult to re replace him if he does decide to retire, won't he, boys? Yeah. He's, he's pretty good. Now, as much a part of Newport's heritage as its transporter bridge, there's no doubt that the audience still want Desmond to carry on. After more than 35 years, Desmond Llewellyn is Q. So will he outlast the fifth Bond? Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> That's up to the almighty. Oh, dear, that is up to the almighty. Yes, well, so far, so good. I must say, I've enjoyed them enormously. And this one in particular. And I must say, it's wonderful working with him. A fellow Kelch, you see? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. It would have been so easy with a new Bond to have had a new Q, but thank God they didn't. I don't know why. This is why we cut. We cut. Now, pay attention, 007. Well, I won't keep her for more than an hour or so, if you'll give me your undivided attention. That's putting it mildly, 007. I never joke about my work, 007. How long did you say the fuse was? Oh, grow up, 007. Oh, here we are. Desmond Llewellyn. Strikes again. Trying to screw me up. Make me forget my lines. Tread on my lines, cut my lines. Basically, just steal the scene. As it should be. As it should be. Desmond Llewellyn. One of a kind. One day to me. The spine to the whole movie. My hero. That's me. Right. Uh,